Welcome back to the Jerusalem Science Contest. Today we're going to be uh, looking at chapter, uh, I believe it's chapter 17, Resources from the Sea. And this is the 11th and uh, penultimate, uh, I think it's the 12th actually, the 12th and penultimate uh, lecture. So there'll be a, only one more lecture that will be uh, next week. Anyway, uh, what I've chosen to talk to you about today, and there's a lot, again, there's a lot of interesting subjects that we could have uh, discussed, but I wanted to look, the book spends a lot of time talking about things like food and mineral resources, but I wanted to look specifically at some drugs or drug candidates uh, that have actually come from marine sources. So uh, for many, many years, people were looking uh, for natural products for new kinds of materials uh, that would be uh, derived from, from things that occur in nature. And uh, we now have very, very rapid uh, throughput screening. So we can actually screen uh, many, many compounds uh, for biological activity. And for instance, there have been uh, some drugs that have actually found, that, uh, found themselves on the marketplace after uh, uh, development, uh, after they have been, uh, maybe, the, maybe the drug that actually went up on the marketplace uh, was not specifically isolated from a natural source, but its structure was actually actually suggested uh, from a naturally occurring uh, compound. For instance, taxol, which is actual, actually uh, uh, isolated from the U, is a, a, a material that has been chemically modified from the original structure, but still without that, um, uh, without that original isolation, it might have been very, very hard uh, to find that particular drug. So uh, people look at things like rare plants in rainforest, and of course the rainforests are being destroyed, so that's harder and harder to do. But people uh, have, uh, within the last uh, 40 or 50 years, uh, have, have really started to look uh, very, very carefully at, um, well, probably more recently than 40 or 50 years, maybe within the last 20 or 30 years anyway, have started to look uh, very carefully at uh, materials that could actually be isolated from things that occur in the in, in the oceans. So, uh, as for instance, um, uh, I think after probably uh, within the last past 50 years, uh, scuba diving uh, became possible, and because of that, people could harvest uh, a lot of uh, uh, creatures uh, without having to go into a submersible submarine or something like that. They could actually. Uh, look at uh, coral colonies and, and uh, scientists could actually harvest these, uh, these creatures and uh, start looking for uh, possible drugs from them. So I'm going to talk about some compounds uh, that are actually uh, being looked at right now. Uh, most of them turn out to be anti-neoplastic agents or at least that's what uh, people are concentrating on very, very heavily. That is curing various kinds of uh, uh, cancer. So uh, I'll be talking a lot about that, and I'll be talking about different kinds of organisms. And the sponge happens to be an organism that we didn't really say a lot about the sponge as a source of natural products, but the sponge, uh, many different kinds of sponges are actually uh, yielding uh, a variety of biologically active molecules, some of which are now undergoing uh, clinical trials. So I want to talk first about, uh, first of all, about the clinical uh, trial uh, process. So in order to protect you, uh, it used to be if you went back maybe 50, 75, 100 years ago, uh, people could sell things before there was, and I don't remember exactly what year it was, but before uh, there was uh, legislation put into place and before the, uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration was created, people could sell virtually anything and make the wi uh, wildest kinds of claims uh, for the activity uh, that that could have. So people were selling some kind of equivalent of snake oil that really didn't do anything. And people were buying it because somebody said, um, well, this worked for me. So they said, well, I guess I'll buy it and see if it works for me as well. Well, we don't work that way anymore. And we, even when we're dealing with uh, natural products, with things that are derived from the sea, there are certain uh, procedures that are in place before you can actually uh, market these kinds of materials. So first of all, you have to make sure um, that, the, um, that the material uh, is not going to be harmful. And uh, the other thing that you have to do is you have to make sure that the material is efficacious. That is, it works. It does what it's supposed to do. And the material um, should have, I mean, if there is some risk associated with the material, the 
gain by using the material has to has to greatly out, outweigh the uh, potential risk in, in, uh, for, from taking the material. So these are the kinds of things that, that have to be considered. Also, you have to know that the material that you're actually taking uh, has the strength uh, and the properties that are actually uh, uh, indicated on the label and that it does what it says on the label and that it can be manufactured in such a way that you know every time that you take it that you're getting the same material with the same strength. So there are processes in place that are called uh, uh, CGMP, which is current good manufacturing processes that have to be um, uh, followed very, very carefully if somebody is going to make, actually produce a drug for human consumption. But before any of that can happen, uh, before, before you can even get to that point, uh, you first have to undergo a series of tests, uh, which are known as clinical trials. And even before you do the clinical trials, you do what are known as preclinical trials. And a lot of these involve various kinds of uh, uh, either, uh, they could be uh, in uh, in vitro studies, which means that they're actually done in glassware, or they could be uh, in vivo studies, which are actually done with living animals. Uh, but they're animal studies that are done, and you want to make sure that you're not killing your animals while you're doing this. Uh, and when, once these things are, are shown to be safe in the animal studies, then a, uh, a small study uh, might be initiated, uh, what is known as a phase one study, and that would have somewhere between 30 and uh, 80 uh, people that are recruited for that study. Now, these would be healthy volunteers, people that do not have, let's say, the disease that you're trying to cure uh, with this particular drug. Or the, or, you know, so what we're trying to do here is just determine uh, that we can that we can uh, actually administer this drug at some level, and it's not going to be uh, toxic to these volunteers. And of course, if signs of toxicity appear, then the study is going to be terminated uh, very very rapidly. So that's phase one. Uh, then you go into phase uh, two, and sometimes phase two is divided up into what's called phase two A and phase two B. And usually, phase two uh, A will have to do with trying to find the effective dose. So what you're doing is now you've got a, a, a larger number of subjects, maybe 100 to 300. By the way, these numbers, 30 to 80, are not exact numbers. I've seen uh, phase one trials that were done on as few as 15 people, and you could probably have 100 subjects in, that, in a phase one trial. Uh, it just depends, or maybe 50 subjects. It just depends uh, on, the, uh, on the particular uh, investigator and how they want to carry it out. But 100 to 300 is not unreasonable for a uh, phase two trial. And uh, again, you're looking, as I said, in 2A, uh, you're trying to find an effective dose. And in uh, 2B, you're trying to find, um, uh, again, it's a smaller number of people, but you're trying to actually find uh, uh, what we would call the, uh, the, the therapeutic dose, a dose at which you can uh, actually uh, uh, see the desired effect. So you're going to recruit, you're going to have a control group uh, in here, you're going to this these these res, these uh, uh, studies are generally double-blind studies, uh, which means that you you've got to control you've got a placebo that's being administered, uh, something that's inactive, and you've got the active drug, and uh, the people that are in the study they don't know which group they they belong to, so they may be in the control group uh, that uh, is getting the placebo, they may be in the active group, and neither the uh, participants nor the investigators. Uh, in most studies know that. So that's called a double-blind study where uh, neither the, uh, uh, the investigator nor the uh, recipient of the drug knows what they're getting. At least they don't know until the end of the, uh, the study. So um, you, you do that kind of a study. And finally, uh, after all this is past phase two, uh, then you may go, uh, the next logical step would be to go into uh, uh, phase three. So before you can get into any, and I'll talk about phase three in a second, but before you can get into any of these phases, you first have to file something called uh, an IND, which is an investig investigational new drug application. And um, this is just to say that we're, we're going to start carrying out these studies, and it has to be approved uh, by the FDA. Uh, after the protocols are examined, and the FDA may uh, uh, allow you to uh, proceed. But these things have to be statistically analyzed. And if something clears uh, phase two, it goes into phase three. These uh, studies, more people, maybe somewhere between one and 3,000 people might be participating. Uh, you, it, it's difficult to recruit that number of people. And these are multi-centered studies. 
So uh, this is not a study that's done by one group of doctors in one place. This is, these are studies that are spread uh, perhaps all over the world or at least all over the United States if we're talking about uh, the FDA. So these are studies that are going to be done in various uh, clinics throughout the United States. And again, very, very carefully controlled. But here uh, you're actually trying to show a, a statistically significant uh, difference between, or at least you're trying to demonstrate that this, this drug actually does what it's supposed to be doing, and you're doing this on a, a fairly large number of people. And if even a very small number of these people uh, should, God forbid, die or get very, very seriously ill, that's probably going to terminate the study. It's very, very difficult to get a, a drug. It's hard to get a drug into phase three because usually they don't last that long. They usually bomb out in phases one or two. And then uh, once you get into phase three, it's very, very difficult uh, to clear all the hurdles uh, that are involved in phase three. So I'm going to talk about some drugs and uh, specifically uh, where they are right now uh, within this, uh, this process. There's also sometimes a phase four that is initiated, uh, not really required by, uh, by the FDA, but sometimes uh, the individual companies will initiate a phase four study, and this might be on uh, particular groups of individuals like pregnant women who wouldn't have been in the original study just to make sure that there are, there are no un, untoward uh, side effects uh, that you don't know about. So um, once, all, once at least the phase three studies are completed, successfully completed, uh, then um, uh, there, uh, uh, people will uh, apply for an NDA, a new drug uh, application, and if that's granted by, uh, by the FDA, then uh, in, uh, after, after uh, a period of time, uh, that that drug will actually appear on the marketplace. And you know, there are not very many drugs that are being introduced at any one time. But drugs from the sea are very, very interesting. So this first slide, I, I'm going to turn the lights out uh, so you can see this a little bit better. But this first slide uh, actually describes, I don't even know, uh, I don't expect you to really be able to see these structures very, very well. Um, hopefully you can see some of these things. Uh, I classify these things as uh, uh, macrolides. So they're, they're basically they're large rings that may have uh, mostly carbon atoms, but there could be other atoms like oxygen atoms uh, within the ring. Uh, you can see there's another large ring over here. It's a little hard to see some of the, it might be a little hard for you to see uh, uh, some of these structures here. But here's another macro, macrolid. Uh, there's another uh, big ring here, although the structure is quite small. Uh, there's another one of these rings here, and a similar compound over here, the dolostatin and neopeltholide uh, uh, have a similar uh, kind of ring system in them. So these are some uh, uh, compounds uh, that are actually isolated uh, from a variety of uh, marine organisms, and I want to talk about a few of these things. So uh, of the compounds that are actually listed uh, in here, uh, which are the six compounds, the four that you see in the corner that's the uh, zestospongin C uh, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the compound called uh, swinolide uh, over here, uh, lasanolide over here, and neopeltolide. All of these are isolated from sponges. Uh, all of them, uh, the, the, uh, the one in the upper left-hand uh, corner comes from the sponge uh, zestospongia exigua. Uh, I won't have the names of all the organisms uh, that these things are derived from. Uh, but that compound, uh, the, this compound here, swinolide, which also comes from a sponge, uh, and uh, 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 lasanolide over here, and the neopeltolide, uh, all of these things are uh, being investigated as anti-cancer agents for various kinds of uh, tumors. And this one over here, the neopeltolide, uh, uh, is also being looked at uh, uh, for its antifungal uh, properties. Now, um, the one um, that's shown down here, dolostatin, has a different source. This comes from the sea hair. This, this compound right here comes from the sea hair, and that's actually being looked at um, as a, um, uh, also as an anti-cancer compound. And that particular one, I believe, is in phase, let me see if I have that. Yeah, that's actually in phase two right now. So that is still being uh, undergoing uh, uh, current investigation. And probably the most uh, interesting thing of all the compounds that are actually shown here is the one uh, right here, bryostatin. 
It's uh, also uh, supposed to have uh, uh, anti-cancer uh, type of activity, but it's been recently shown that this particular uh, molecule actually is, uh, some, has some efficacy in um, uh, reducing uh, the effects of Alzheimer's disease. So it's actually an anti-Alzheimer's disease. Well, I'm not gonna, I won't say that it would prevent it, but it's, it, it gives people a uh, much greater uh, cognitive ability uh, for longer periods of time. And that also is, at least in, in some preliminary studies that have been done, and that's very, very early on in uh, clinical trials right now. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's just one slide of the two.